easy. Uh, and yeah, we hopefully we can resolve some of those problems. Um, I am Kevin Everett. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I've been a faculty member at the University of Missouri for about 20 years. My department is family and community medicine. And early parts of my career, I had a clinical practice and did um, therapy with um, patients really from age probably eight to 80 um, on various problems. And the latter part of my career has been working more on um, public health ventures that kind of join clinical health care and public health. And um, one of the projects we've been working on is a, a team from MU and a team from Central Ozarks Medical Center have been addressing why folks are getting COVID vaccination and why they are not in your community and, and um, partnering with COMC to be able to bring the community kind of to be as healthy as they can possibly be. So I'm really excited to have a few people from COMC here today, um, a couple of other uh, experts in addressing uh, youth mental health issues as well as substance abuse issues. Um, and what we're going to do today is I'm going to give opportunity from some of the students who are on this call to be able to share out sort of what they see in, in their school and in their areas, um, what they feel like the, the top challenges have been, especially kind of COVID has really shaken everybody up. It's made us all have a new way of life. And, and I don't just mean in our personal lives, but I mean in how education has taken place, um, how healthcare has been delivered. So it's lots of changes for everyone and that creates stress and it can also exacerbate um, existing problems. And we have people on this call, I think that can begin to, to talk through and build out solutions. Um, uh, hopefully eventually uh, Desiree Malam, who's a school counselor beyond. We also have uh, Jakeitha Decker, Christy Atkins um, and Sean Billings who are health uh, professionals who addressing this. And then Clayton Gregory is also going to share his perspectives as a student um, who also has done some work in emergency management and some other areas that give him a unique perspective on, on some of these things. So what I'd like to do is just um, some of you who are students that are on this call, if you can uh, go ahead and unmute and just kind of share out kind of the stress that goes on, the problems you see, the problems you're concerned about. I think we should all think about this conversation as confidential. There's no really no such thing as confidential, but I think that the sharing of information will be best if we kind of recognize and, and uh, share honestly and understand that this is not a, a time to name names. So if you have specific examples, please um, don't use a name. Don't use a name, use an example when you talk about problems. That's that's my request on that. Would anyone like to step up and kind of just talk a little bit about concern, problems around substance abuse or around uh, mental health stress and, and, and challenges? Please let, let us know what school you're at too when you, when you do that. No brave volunteers at this juncture. I'll go ahead and go. Can you guys hear me? Oh, thank you, Daniel. Yep. Yeah, so um, I'm at University of Florida Department of Neurosurgery, um, but I'm actually a master's student here in California at California State East Bay. And um, yeah, so mental health, I think uh, that starts from, you know, from when you're in the womb all the way until you go into the tomb. So mm -hmm. I think you have to deal with it your whole life. Um, it's one of the first things that you should address and strengthen um, and being able to do that holistically and like uh, all encompassingly, I think would, would be uh, the best, the best way kind of um, bring in everything that you know and that you've experienced and then apply it to strengthen your, your mental health, which um, includes mostly your brain, you know, so being able to take care of your brain, uh, nervous system central and peripheral would be best. I think uh, substance use is uh, is common, especially even in academia, um, but outside probably more common. 
Um, but I know a lot of students do use substances, whether they're prescribed or not prescribed, uh, to get through the challenges of, of uh, education. And um, yeah, so it's something I've experienced, uh, something that I've, I've seen my community experience. And I think the more we educate adolescents um, before they get into college, and even while they're in high school or middle school, um, it would be beneficial for them to be aware of um, you know, positive and negative consequences of each substance. Um, but I think, you know, they shouldn't necessarily, I mean, being able to hear it from, a, from a doctor a professional quote unquote would be, would be best. Um, but even doing their own investigation and research and valuing that as well would be, um, would be good for, for the person coming up because we rely on the next generation to take over from what, um, what the ones before them have accomplished. So yeah, um, I think uh, I think that's good. During the pandemic, I know it's it's even harder. Um, people were sheltered in their homes and had to deal with that. But I think we're moving out of that, and getting out of that, and um, yeah. So we have to be able to take what we learned from before, during, and after, and apply it. Outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, you, you hit on a lot of issues and especially about taking care of yourself and thinking about best strategies to do that. Um, other comments, um, either about what Daniel had to say or just, just to add on to, to some of those things. You know, I'll jump in just real quick just to feed off of some of Daniel's comments. As far as building resiliency, I think some things that we can do, which is totally in our control, what we put in our bodies, right? What we eat and how that improves health, exercise, right? Those are two things that can definitely improve brain health, brain function, make you feel good and, uh, you know, give you some of those um, same chemicals that, you know, some of these controlled substances produce like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, all these wonderful chemicals that your brain produces to help you function day to day. Great. So um, how do we give voice to this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I I think um, middle school, high school for sure is a time we are uh, going to see um, people experimenting using sort of a. Um, risk-taking behavior, if you will. And so you're going to see people making efforts at use of vaping, um, vaping various substances, nicotine or, or THC, marijuana. You see marijuana use, lots of alcohol use. Um, and I think for those of us who have been in the field, we always recognize the challenge that um, those early trials of use can be really dangerous um, because of, of people, their just impulsive nature in, in, in younger ages um, and not having an understanding of, of how the chemicals could have sudden effects and those types of things. Um, and I think there's the awareness of, of having to address these things in, in the context of peer pressure that comes about. And I, I think all of those are really relevant when uh, we try to think about how to keep a, that age folks reaching their independence, doing it safely, and um, uh, kind of supporting health, as was mentioned by Sean, is thinking of ways we are going to uh, bring about healthy offerings that fire up those endorphins and other good chemicals that make us feel good. Um, I think that's the thing there. The body has a natural way to do that. Um, but sometimes um, people look for other outside substances to pull that off for them. And that, that's the challenge is, can we get people to, to work on their um, more healthy behaviors that it release and make you feel good with endorphins and other things in your body? Um, 
Clayton, I might call on you just to tell a little bit about your experience in school and, and work and, and, and kind of add to this conversation. So I am a volunteer firefighter here in the Richland, as well as I do work at the 911 Center in Waynesville, which covers mainly Richland. And um, I, I can see firsthand exactly from either on the phone or overall um, how substance abuse and mental health can affect uh, young people or even adults in the community. Um, what exactly are you guys asking today? Just sort of, it, it, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for the students, but any levels of um, maybe some of the consequences you've seen or the ways that help comes when somebody's in, in, in a crisis with, with either mental health or um, substance abuse. Well, I know when we received, I can, let's go for 911. When we received the call initially, um, we'll go through a series of questions and figure out what exactly is happening so we can get the correct response to you. So um, mainly like the mental um, mental health ones usually fall under our mental emotional call. Um, nature, we call it, call nature. So uh, that's how it goes in for that. Yeah. And I could maybe let um, some of our panelists, either Christy or or Jakitha or others, Desiree, Desiree. Um, I think a lot of students might be hesitant if they see one of their friends having trouble. They've taken a, a pill or they've take, smoked something and they're really looking like they're in a medical situation. They they might get nervous that they get in trouble if they call 911. And I, I don't think that's the truth. Um, I think actually you you are shielded, so to speak, from any kind of trouble by helping. But I'd like others to speak to that if they will. Hi, uh, my name is Jaquitha Decker. I am the peer support specialist for Central Ozark Medical Center. Um, being a CPS means that I am a recovering addict myself. I have 11 years clean. Um, for the students, the, one of the most important things that I think you guys should know is um, we no longer focus so much on abstinence. It's more focused around harm reduction because um, with the world today, everyone's tempted to try or be around or maybe not even be the one that's trying or be around and just be exposed to. And so it's very important for you guys to be educated on harm reduction and what to do if those situations occur. Um, for students, I think that one of the most important things for you to know is the recovery position. Um, what he was speaking of is if you're around somebody that is in crisis, um, it's very important for you to roll them on their side and put their hands under their head in a cradle position and um, pull their knee up so they don't roll over to aspirate. And in the state of Missouri, we have passed the Good Samaritan Law, which means that you will not get in trouble if you contact 911 in a distress call to save somebody's life. You will not receive, get in punishment or the person that is in the crisis at the moment. Um, that is very important because as even adults, um, our first response is nobody wants to get hurt, nobody wants to get in trouble and what are we going to do? Your first response is to get your friends help. Um, a little bit about my job and my role here at the clinic is I meet peers exactly where they're at. Um, I have an open door policy. You may come and talk to me anytime. Um, we, we have Narcan here in the office um, at our locations, Pulaski County um, Health Department, the fire department. Um, recently, we've just bought um, some vending machines that are going in in the area where you just go up and dispute your own Narcan. It's very important to know how to distribute. It's very simple. If um, somebody is in distress, you take this little, I actually have some sitting on my desk. Um, it's a spray that you put up the nose and you just spray up their nose. You cannot harm anyone by giving them Narcan, just by not giving them Narcan. But one of the most important things that you know is that once it's administered, they still need to seek medical attention. Um, but 
I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so uh, my job here is to meet, here's exactly where they're at. Um, my job for the community and for my own personal is if anyone um, is not comfortable reaching out, um, you can contact my phone number here anonymous, anonymously at the clinic. And if you have any questions um, and I could guide you in the direction that your resources of what you need. Um, there is tons and tons of resources out there that um, if anyone's scared or don't know the answer or don't know where to look, um, just ask. That's the most important is just ask and um, talk about it. My, I don't have much of opinion on COVID at all, except um, it's taught people how to isolate. And um, for myself, isolation is a very scary place to me. Um, and it's hard really to get back into social networking, but that's the only way that um, I myself has been able to find recovery is to reach out and to know where to look. And so if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me anytime. Thank you, Jacuta. Jacuta. Sorry, miss, I'm stumbling on your name, but I really appreciate you sharing some really um, sort of vital information about how to handle emergency situations, but also that, that COMC has a, an expert available specifically to help um, youth um, who are struggling with wide-ranging problems. I don't think she's just talking about substance abuse, but it could be any of the kind of stressors that have people um, feeling at wit's end. Um, maybe we could turn to Christy Atkins, and, and I know you're a nurse at COMC, and maybe share out a little bit about uh, the role that you have and, and any other thoughts you have about how to help youth in your community um, be healthier and, uh, and help when they're in crisis. Uh, my name's Christy Atkins and I've been a nurse for 20 years, but I've been a nurse practitioner for five years here at COMC. Um, I have two kids. Uh, my oldest is 23 and my youngest is 17. Uh, I see a lot of kids uh, that come in with anxiety and depression. And my goal is to get them to the right place, whether it be medication or get them to counseling and use our school-based counselors or to count, maybe if they don't want medication to get to counseling, to get someone to talk to them because sometimes they don't want medication. Um, but we, since COVID, I have seen a lot of kids try different drugs, whether it be vaping, smoking, alcohol, that has been on a rise. But also I see a lot of bullying going on too and the isolation with kids going back into schools, kids getting picked on and just situations caused by that, the anxiety situations, social anxiety increase, which then they just don't know how to handle it. And my goal is to help them feel better about themselves and get them to see Desiree, which she's our school-based counselor or someone like that to get hopefully the help they need. So we have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have, <laughs> uh, so we offer on our school-based side we have therapists in several schools in the lake area uh, iberia lakeway richland here at plato and so we provide services like you would get in our clinical setting so mm -hmm. students receive professional therapy um, in the school setting so it cuts down on absent absenteeism um, maintains consistency because we can see them you know, we just go and get them from their class and bring them back. Um, I have seen an increase in our depression and anxiety rates um, as well um, as the bullying. We also see an increase in um, some experimentation. Um, so, you know, they're hanging out with friends because there's not much else to do. So this is what, you know, oh, they find this or someone has given it to them, they bought it 
And so I've seen an increase in some experimentation. Um, and again, you know, it's just education and helping them understand kind of what that looks like long term. Um, and then, you know, helping them find um, assistance if I feel like it's gone too far. I don't see a whole lot of opioid use here, um, as far as I know, not that anyone has admitted. Um, we do have a lot of alcohol, um, a lot of marijuana use, um, you know, <laughs> the girls are laughing, but yeah, no, we do see, we see a lot of that, um, that, you know, we've even had it actually here at school um, in the past. So it's pretty, it's pretty common. Yeah, and, and I think that um, recreational marijuana use, um, I think some places are gonna start opening up relatively soon. And that's, even though these students are too young for that, that we know that that doesn't mean that it won't become more um, accessible, similar to the way they can access alcohol. And um, I, do, I am working with a group of researchers studying that very problem. Um, and so it'll be interesting in a couple of years if we have any new insights on on how legalization and age limits are addressing things on tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. Um, it is a concern. Um, each of those products have those short-term um, effects that can have negative, real negative consequences, and then obviously chronic and long-term use and abuse can become a, a real big issue. Um, I uh, wanted to let Sean also speak just a little bit more. He will, represents Missouri Hospital Association, and and they may have more global issues they're trying to address for hospitals and communities around the state. Just to be able to talk just a little bit about that, if you don't mind, Sean. Yeah, I'll uh, keep it brief. One thing that I just want to point out real quick is we had a conference back in 2022. And we invited one of the supervisors over all the school-based clinicians at the Springfield Public School System, Dr. Allison Roffers. And in the Springfield Public School System, they use an acronym called BARC. And it's some sort of software suite where basically when they give the student body electronic hardware, right, whether it's iPads or Surface Pros, they basically keep a watch on the students, right? And you guys know that and consent to it up front. So if there's any like banter going on that speaks to suicidal ideation, you know, bullying, um, substance use, and I see some, some uh, head shaking. So I guess that might be universal throughout the state. Now it assumes something that, you know, the student has hardware that is in the possession of the school, but just some stats real quick that, Dr. Roffer shared with that software. So in a 12 month period from July 1st to 2021 to June 8th, almost a whole year, they had like 25,000 alerts. The biggest, the most prevalent was self-harm or suicidal ideation at 15,000. And number five at around 2,200 was drug and alcohol related content. And there's bullying, weapons, you know, so on and so forth. And I just share that just, you know, that's an extra um, tool for the school-based clinicians just to tap into to help lift up support students that might be struggling. I think that's spot on. Um, but speaking from the, the Missouri Hospital Association, a good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sean Billings. I've served there for about five years. And before that time, I served the Missouri State Courts for about 20. Um, I've served families and community members, put simply, my entire career who has struggled with behavioral health, almost exclusively use disorder. And I'll tell you that COVID, at least the data that we're looking at, you know, the community members that historically would walk through the four walls of our, you know, substance use treatment providers or hospitals, community-based organizations that are geared and equipped to treat behavioral health malady, 
we basically stopped doing that in COVID, right? We're socially isolating, we're staying in our homes. So what we saw with data, and this is true for every population, even grandma and grandpa, that we saw an increased prevalence in use disorder, behavioral health diagnoses, and subsequent death. And the deaths by and large are a direct result of fentanyl exposure within our drug supply chain. And one very important point that I want to make is even though you guys might not use opioids, what is an opioid anyway? Fentanyl? What is this fentanyl stuff? What our drug dealers are doing, because there's so much money to be made in fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, which is 100 times more potent than an opioid, is they're making money off of it and they're putting it in methamphetamine cocaine, pressing their own pills with fentanyl. We've served a couple youth, um, and I'll just say college kids, that have ingested a marijuana gummy, but unbeknownst to them, that marijuana gummy was cut with fentanyl and it almost killed them, right? So when we talk about, you know, experimenting with drugs, you need to be just, yeah, hyper cautious um, and be very mindful of what, again, you're putting into your body. Um, the landscape out there today is um, frightening, uh, very frightening. And despite all of that, though, there is a ton of resources that are taking root within the state and nationally just to help provide additional support to youth and to adults. Uh, whether it's beefing up children's division and being for, more intentional and mindful for those families, community members that might have a child or children taken into care due to use disorder, um, whether that's a result of the parent's use or the child's use. Um, you know, there's a lot of programming going on in the justice system, specifically the juvenile justice system to help with mentoring, right, making and creating stronger social connections, um, a lot of programs helping with bullying, but a lot of them are centric to having that mentor mentee relationship right people in our lives that can lift us up, be a support be that beacon, um, yeah, and give us two ears, right? And I'd be surprised at how many of, you know, the students here that, you know, you're sitting around the kitchen table breaking bread with mom and dad or whoever you live with and, you know, just casual conversation. You're talking about, well, you know what, I'm kind of depressed, mom or dad, you know, and I've been feeling this way for weeks. Those are things that we hide from one another, right? We want folks to think that we've got it all figured out. We're strong mentally and we're going to charge into the day. But reality is, is we're human beings and we're supposed to feel all the feels. And sometimes those feels aren't the best. And we need to figure out how to feel better, right? And again, you know, humanity is a contact sport. It requires us to lean on one another in order to get better. Um, so anyway, I'll stop there. I could just keep rambling on and on. I really appreciate the comments I'm hearing. Um, I think that um, one is we've presented a lot of information and shared that there are um, people here to help train professionals sort of at a, um, a very local level in your school, a local level in your clinic, medical clinics that are around. Um, even you've got a local student who helps on emergency uh, telephone lines and phones. So we, you have resources. Sean mentions that state agencies and organizations like him are, are trying to build out programs around the state. Um, I'm just curious for the students, um, is there a sense of being able to aware of those or if you've heard of any of them, if there's new questions you have based on the information, happy to, to let these professionals answer those questions or or if you have comments about the, these kind of things, please, uh, this would be a great time now. I just don't wanna let us keep talking without you all having an opportunity to have your questions answered. And if you feel more comfortable, type them in the chat too. That, that's right? another way to do that. And Zeo will monitor, monitor that.
Yeah, I, I mentioned as we started that you can't in a Zoom like this assure confidentiality when you're talking um, on a on an open Zoom like this. But the one thing that that every student should know is when you go and talk to any of the people that have been talking about providing services, you do receive confidentiality. Um, that way they can hear the most honest things that are troubling you and then um, help you deal with those. Um, and I think that that's a, um, a real important thing, but it's a barrier because people, people don't want to, uh, they're worried about what, what will happen with information that they talk about. And I think that's the, the beauty of getting the kind of help that we're describing here. Um, did any of the information you heard surprise you? Well, that's a great question. Um, how, how could we get more students to seek help? They, there's lots of um, substance abuse um, and even people using illegal um, substances. Uh, any thoughts on the way we, we can help people go and get help from our, our experts? I'll jump in just real quick. I think we have to create a culture and environment socially where it's acceptable for me, the little Sean Billings, a student to go to my school-based clinician, to go to my teacher because it, it's okay. And I there's trust there. Um, and I feel comfortable enough to reach out to my teacher, whoever that beacon is. You know, I don't know, is that the landscape, the environment today in our schools where we feel that level of trust with administration, where when I'm feeling a little blue that I'm gonna reach out, if the answer is no, we need to help drive that and create that because you guys spend the majority of your time in those schools, in those classrooms, you're around all kinds of different personalities, right? Outside of what your job is, you're supposed to right, retain all this information and be good students. Um, you know, that's a lot, it's a lot. So I think, you know, just creating a culture, and that's on all of us. It's not just on, you know, leadership and administration, the teachers, it's with the student body too. Um, but then also looking at the workforce, do we have enough mental health professionals in the schools, in the state to treat the need? And I'm going to spit out a couple stats real quick. When we look at the state of Missouri, we rank number 22 in the nation um, when it comes to prevalence across the board, across age cohorts. But when we look at the state of Missouri, as far as what is the ratio of mental health professionals versus those who need the help, the ratio is 490 Missourians that need professional help for every one therapist professional. So I'm gonna say that again, 490 to one. So where that ranks us out of our 50 states is number 37, right? So tremendous opportunity for our state to do more. Specifically, we need more workforce to handle the needs that youth, adults, all of us have, whether it's mental health or use disorder. Yeah, and if I could add to, um, I think we're getting closer to knowing more about personalized genomics. And I think if we can um, understand more and get more data on our personal genomics, then we can understand how these substances or drugs interact with our physiology. Because I've seen firsthand um, um, a variety of drugs or substances such as psilocybin mushrooms, cannabis, and even alcohol cause seizures. So I think the literature, the medical literature is still lacking in that. Um, I've asked professionals about this, researchers, doctors, and like, well, I'll have to look at the National Public Library of Medicine because I've never heard of this. You know, I don't know anything about this. So I think when students are experimenting with drugs, they might not be aware of the physiological consequences that could happen just by experimenting one or two different times, you know, you could end up in the hospital and with, um, you know, not necessarily uh, irreversible conditions, because I think, you know, every pathology can be treated. 
um, as we advance um, diagnosis and therapeutics. But uh, yeah, so I just would encourage the student population to consider finding out more about their DNA and more about how they want to interact with their environment. I think that's a really interesting point in terms of where we are with our science and our ability to treat. And there are some advances where um, at, at some point in time, we will really understand. I've, I've studied how to help people quit smoking for a long time. And we're just beginning to kind of get into the idea that different people are different. You probably have known different people who've been able to quit smoking pretty easy. And then there are people who just really, really struggle. And part of that is your genetics. And some of us have different ways we metabolize nicotine. And so um, to Daniel's point, it's probably true in terms of the way your body adjusts or addresses certain kinds of drugs. And now um, Sean mentioned lacing other drugs with a very powerful synthetic drug. I don't think any of our genetics can overcome that kind of assault. And that's what we have to be concerned about. Um, uh, I was going to turn our topic just a little because we've mentioned the stress of COVID and on how it's affected all of our lives. What about the actual having people in your family with COVID, being worried about getting COVID? Does that play a role um, for people here in the audience? And um, how are our health professionals and, and um, mental health professionals uh, addressing that? I bring it up. I just had a sad conversation with my adult daughter. She's young. She's 24. Um, and she just tested positive. And I could tell it just really stressed her out. Not that she's feeling horrible, but she's feeling bad. And just what it does for having to stay away from work, stay away from friends, stuff like that. And and I just wondered how that goes for people in, the, in high school or having to address it when it's in your family. I think Chrissy, I don't know if you're getting ready to hop in there. And... Oh, she's on mute. Well, talking centrically to COVID real quick, and then I'll I'll be quiet. You know, one thing the Missouri Hospital Association has done, and this certainly isn't unique to the healthcare workforce, but COVID really did a number on all of our workforces, right? We've got staff cycling in and out. We too, I mean, we are those community members who are socially isolating, right? We're all in these stats, all of us. So we've spent a lot of time on self-care, right? Reaching out to our HR departments, even our own with an MHA, do we do enough? Do we create a culture where Sean Billings feels comfortable um, tapping into you know, services through, EA, uh, through our HR EAP services for counseling because maybe I'm having you know, a hard time. Um, now, there's this whole thing, too, with even those of us who have insurance due to stigma, and I loved and really appreciated a, a comment in here just about, well, what if we don't feel like counseling is like bad or it's not good, right, just because of the stigma around there. And same thing with like insurance and tapping some of these services, that stigma can force people not to you know, go through their insurance because they're afraid they're going to increase premiums or the insurance provider or their employer is going to think less of them because they're somehow, right, they're damaged or they're not well. Um, so we've been very intentional to kind of re-engineer that to make it more palatable for people to know it's okay to have those feelings. And by the way, we've got some resources to help you get through that. So I think anything that we can do to lift one another up to make it okay to to not feel okay, yeah. I think is gonna, yeah, it's it, we're on to something there. I, I see a message in the chat um, that some of the students from Laquay have have something to offer and contribute. I'm happy to hear from you. Oh, oh, it's going. Um, so I feel that COVID around our school has been like it caused everybody to have really bad like depression and anxiety and I feel like a lot of them like wouldn't go talk to anybody 
And I heard, like, I overhear people talking about how whenever they went through it, they distanced themselves from everybody. They wouldn't talk to anybody and that they needed help, but they never did anything about it. And I feel that like when I find out, if I find out a family member tests positive, I get kind of sad and nervous because I'm like, it could go either way. Like they could fight it off or they could possibly lose their life because of it. You got anything to add? No, that's what I was going to say. That's all we have. I, I think your point about um, when others get it, kind of that it, it does jump to your mind. Oh, I hope nothing horrible happens. <clears throat> A lot of people are now have vac been vaccinated or whatever, but they still get COVID and you, you'd hope that that helps them to not have the severe, but this is a new thing, right? I mean, I think other generations way back in history had some other major issues where they were thinking of these things, but we as a society haven't had something like this where when when a person gets it, um, we have these kind of thoughts and those are those are high stress thoughts, especially for people that are younger. As we get older, we we have faced a lot of challenges and learned to manage our emotions with those, but that, that's rough on somebody um, in your age. I, I applaud you guys for the resilience you've already developed at such a young age, managing the kind of challenges we've been discussing. Other comments from anyone? Well, I know um, a lot of those kids when COVID first came out in 2020, they missed almost a whole like year of school. So they weren't around anybody while they were trying to figure out the processes. Um, so they were, you know, isolating and trying to figure out everything. So a lot of those kids were not around anybody so that just increased their anxiety depression so i can understand why that would be increased anxiety when they went back to school and i still see kids today that won't go back to school because of that Um, I'd like to jump in. There's a comment in the chat uh, that's asking to expand a little bit more on harm reduction. Um, we talked about harm reduction from a uh, kind of opioid use disorder standpoint. Um, is there harm, are there harm reduction strategies uh, that deal more with other substances or uh, with mental health crises? I can speak a little bit, so just so that people have a broader understanding of what that term means, but harm reduction comparative to abstinence. And so say somebody is concerned about their alcohol use, um, a traditional treatment would be to get people to not drink any alcohol and help them think about ways to not have alcohol in their lives. A harm reduction strategy might be to help somebody think about really being purposeful and, and thinking through how and when to drink. And so harm reduction would be never drink and then go drive. Um, if you have a drink um, or you're gonna be going to a party, make sure that you've eaten food, quite a bit of food before because having food in your belly um, helps um, with the way alcohol um, goes into your system and affects your brain have an understanding of how much alcohol will lead you into inebriation. And there's good, um, and inebriation is when you're gonna get into all kinds of trouble. And I'm not just talking legal, you get inebriated and you don't think um, uh, the way you normally do. And you could put yourself at risk for assault or other things. And so harm reduction is kind of teaching you a way to use alcohol. I'm just using that example um, in a way that would be um, avoid 
bad harms, if you will, um, avoid um, becoming physically dependent on it where you're drinking so much that if you quit drinking, you have withdrawal or something like that. And so harm reduction can be used in a lot of um, different substances. Um, it also, there are probably situations where people should not use harm reduction, where they just haven't been able to manage that type of address use of, of techniques, and they just need to stay away from it and be abstinent and, and figure out their life without alcohol or without it, without any kind of drugs. Did that help explain harm reduction a little bit? And I think that alcohol is a really good example. And I know that from my personal experience, I didn't get any harm reduction messaging related to alcohol until I got to college. And um, I don't know if that's the case, if that has improved at all for high schoolers now, uh, but I'd be curious to hear from some students if that's messaging that you've ever heard around alcohol or if that's something that people in your student body know about. Um, and I guess that along with that, if y'all are typing anything in the chat, um, I'll give you a second. But another sentiment that I've seen a lot uh, in the Q&A is just the idea of reducing stigma that it is okay to seek counseling um, or that, um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a personal failure to uh, be struggling with substance use or mental health. Um, are there specific strategies that we can employ, whether it is training students to talk about those issues um, or ways that we can facilitate those narratives in high schools? I guess what's being done now and what works? I'll just comment that I think as a take home message I've been hearing is that's still an issue we need to keep working on. Um, that, that's still an issue even for adult populations, college populations is um, making it okay to seek help. Um, there's something about the way uh, uh, our society is, is it that we come across this false belief that we've got to just do everything on our own and figure it out. That's the, the hallmark of being an adult or something like that, or getting to become an adult. And, and the reality is probably some of the strongest people I know as, when I, as I watch them get through problems is they go and talk to trusted sources and figure out their problem. Um, so they're always seeking help. They're always seeking ways to, to, to address challenges that are being put before them. And we we, we've just got to figure out a better way. I, that was the note I jotted is that from this community talk is um, anything we can do in your community that makes it okay to go get the help you need. That's, that's why, I mean, I think it's great that um, CONC has put and an invested in the schools with counselors. I think it's great that CONC has specific people at their clinics with expertise to help in these situations. We need to probably keep making people aware of that, finding ways on social media and other things where students go that they hear a message that they can get help as they need it. Just to add on that real quick, I think stigma, I don't think I know, stigma is still probably one of the biggest barriers and challenges I have through my work. And it's been that way for the last 25 years. And I would say this, anytime that we can educate and explain and share some of the good stuff as far as evidence-based practices, focusing on use disorder is not a moral failing and looking at it as a chronic brain disease, again, using science. Now, it's not to say there was, oh my gosh, I had no idea, you know, now that Sean just, you know, shared this with me, now I totally, you know, think the opposite way. And I get that, but it's slowly 
taking away and chipping away at that stigma and to synthesize real quick. And I've got to hop for a 1230 meeting, but, you know, something that we often talk about is language and words matter. I believe that wholeheartedly, right? How we treat other people is everything. So every single person on this call right now, you choose what words come out of your mouth and how we treat people. So once you put on that tie, if you will, and go to work, that same principle or principles take root. And it's, again, it's so simple and it sounds so simple, but it's so hard, right? So I guess in summary, yeah, just, uh, I guess that was my summary, but yeah. I, I, I am checking time and we are getting close to the end. Um, yeah, ways we can knock down stigma and and create areas where people know they can go and feel safe and get help i i am i did see that that comment of so many people maybe at that age that are using those they they don't think they're going to do it anything could happen to them they they feel like they're indestructible um maybe they haven't had a consequence to to doing this stuff i think that that probably still happens even to some adults um, too. But I, I do think that um, there's enough experience out there with these substances knowing they can cause harm, particularly you're at the age where you get trusted be, to be on the, on the road. Um, and so when people are under the influence of a variety of things, they put other people at risk, right? They put you at risk if your friends are out there. Um, and I think that's that's sort of some of the things personal responsibility letting letting people do what they want having that autonomy sure that's a, a nice quality we have in this country but the respect for one another to be safe towards one another is equally as important um and i don't thank you sean we really appreciate your your comments and help today on this um i just i uh encourage you to to if you are feeling unsafe um, in situations to find ways to, to get help. I encourage you to make use of these community resources and, and we wanna build out better resources for your community as well. And so any, any way we can continue this dialogue to, uh, to build these out, uh, we got, we, we're trying to, we want the stress to go away about COVID. We want the the, we want you to feel like you can manage the kind of stress that comes with this without using substances, without it having hard impact on your, your mental health. And, and so anything we can do to build this out in, in the lake area, you know, that's what some of these professionals are all about. So please dialogue with them. Um, please help us uh, kind of build a, a healthier place for everyone to be uh, uh, reaching their goals and, their, and what they want to do. Any other final comments that people would like to say before we wrap up? Oh, that's that's something. Please go ahead and fill out the evaluation if you if it if you're able to. That would be great. If I if I can just jump in real quick and address Chloe Sterner's question, um, the. As a, as a behavior, as a mental health provider, um, as a school-based therapist, I would rather have a student come to me and get help and really not need it than have someone not come and get help because they're afraid they're not going to be believed. Um, I am always going to default to a place of belief. And because if you're pretending like you have a mental health issue, you really have a mental health issue. Yeah, Lincoln agrees. You really have a mental health issue if that is the way you're trying to get attention. So uh, help your friends and your classmates understand that when you come to counseling, our main focus is to help you be successful and find the resources that you need um, to meet your daily goals and your life goals. And so you will always be believed. Um, that I don't ever have anybody come in my office and go, oh no, you don't have depression. Oh no, you don't have anxiety. That's not my place. Um, you know, because there are issues that are 
help, you know, encouraging you to feel that way. If you feel like you have depression, then there is something that is contributing to that. Does that kind of make sense, Chloe? Thanks. And I know there are lots of resources and Zia put together a resource page as well. If we can distribute that at some point, that would be fantastic. Thanks to everyone for uh, sitting in and attending. Great conversation. I hope it's uh, sort of a start of, of something that we can build upon. And, you know, hey, it's going to be really nice weather in, in central Missouri. Uh, the, the deep freeze is over. Go out and have a really um, healthy outdoor activity on your, on your weekend this weekend. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate the time. Have a great weekend. Okay, just real quickly to all the panelists, uh, to the students and the folks from COMC and everybody, thank you so much. Thank you so much for bearing with us as we get this sorted out. And, um, you know, thanks for being here. This was really great. Have a good weekend. Yes, have a good weekend. Thank you, Zia. Have a good weekend. I appreciate that, Zia. Thanks for your work on this as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Bye.